gonna mug me. I'm not gonna mug you. Is that gorgeous or what, eh? And I believe I can run the Peace and Marathon. Download Veely now. The goal of the mission 1000 Days for the Planet is to document the beauty and fragility of biodiversity on Earth. But we also realize that life in the oceans is truly threatened. Oceans cover more than 70% of the Earth's surface. And their volume is about 300 times more than land-based environments. So the oceans play a vital role in the balance of life on this planet. Life abounds in the Big Blue in a variety of shapes and colors ranging from microscopic creatures to the last giants of the world. Unfortunately, our limitless exploitation of the oceans and our savage history with certain resources tell a sad tale. After nearly wiping out whale populations, we have developed ever more sophisticated fishing techniques, which have exerted an unsustainable pressure on ocean resources. Today, it is estimated that 87% of the oceans are overexploited or exploited to their very limits by the fishing industry. Large ocean predators have been especially affected by our insatiable appetite for resources of the sea. It is estimated that 90% of large fish have disappeared in recent decades. Despite their threatened status, the fishing industry still harvests about 65 million sharks each year. Sharks were long considered an accidental catch or bycatch on long liners, fishing boats that release kilometers and kilometers of fishing line into the sea, aimed primarily at catching large fish. But sharks are no longer a bycatch. Today, they are targeted directly. In the past, there was no market for shark meat, but the recent development of the lucrative Asian market for shark fins has completely changed all that. The consequences for ocean ecosystems are disastrous. There are recent scientific publications that say that, in general, all marine predators have declined 90% in the last 50 years. So, you know, it's, it's not looking good. We've invited scientists aboard the Sedna, people who are passionate about what they do and who have dedicated their lives to saving the ocean's large predators. Biologists Pedro Afonso and George Fontes have joined the Sedna Four for this expedition. These scientists from the University of the Azores are also skilled fishermen who are able to catch a shark with a line and hooks specially designed not to hurt the animal. They will team up with Randall Arauz, a scientist and activist who has become well known internationally for his campaigns against shark fishermen, especially those who practice shark finning. Our first stop was the Azores in the middle of the Atlantic. It's a place I love. It's filled with history. It's a sailor's paradise. On the beaches, the docks, even in the bars, you can feel the history and smell the sea. Sailors love to stop at the small port of Horta on Fayal Island. Located on either side of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, the Azores Archipelago is the result of 20 million years of volcanic activity. The spectacular scenery of the islands, which have emerged only 5 million years ago, continues to evolve and change. 
as a result of volcanoes and the movement of three major tectonic plates that meet here. In the oceans, seamounts rise up to the surface, which brings up nutrient-rich waters that feed an impressive diversity of marine life. In seamounts, you typically have upwelling um, events, that is, deep water that carries nutrients along the slopes of the seamount to surface or at least to depths where the animals can profit from it. Seamounts not only have more biomass or more animals, they have more species, including the top predators that might be travelers of the ocean, but that might stop on particular seamounts because they have the increased productivity which they can profit from. Everybody goes to the seamounts, including men, of course. Many migratory species appear to use these seamounts in some phase of their lives. But only recently have scientists discovered the important role played by seamounts around the world. We could probably try to do that like again, like at four. One of the very first seamounts to be declared worldwide um, as a marine reserve for scientific purposes, so we can understand the whole process from bottom to top, is the Condor Seamount, which was declared a marine reserve about three years uh, ago. And this is just, just outside Aldor, which is a fantastic opportunity for all of us, scientists, fishermen, and managers, to understand how these seamounts work so we can better protect them. The volcanic seamounts in the Azores cause nutrient-rich currents to rise to the surface, which attracts pelagic species such as hammerhead sharks, whose status is precarious and which are increasingly rare in the world's oceans. Hammerhead sharks are among the most endangered sharks. All pelagic sharks are reduced 90% during the last 50 years, but hammerheads are down 98, 99% in certain areas of the world, so they need a lot of help. The crew of the Sedna 4 hopes to install satellite tags on young hammerhead sharks that seem to use some areas of the Azores as a nursery. The hammerheads are naturally less abundant because they produce much less offspring to start with. Secondly, they uh, actually um, make what we call some kind of parental care to their offspring in the sense that they move to very specific habitats where females think that their pups are going to have increased chances of survival during their first uh, months and, and years. So the nurseries of, of, of hammerheads are typically located in these very coastal areas, shallow uh, uh, inlets, uh, mangroves in the tropics. In the particular case of this hammerhead species, the smooth hammerhead, we think that oceanic islands such as the Azores might play a crucial role as nursery habitats for the North Atlantic population of this species. In places like the Azores, there has been no historical fishing pressure on hammerhead populations locally, and this continues to be the case, fortunately. However, the adults which live an oceanic lifestyle are also attracted to the long lines, the industrial long line, in open water. And they are indeed uh, a bycatch, a typical bycatch of this fishery. And that is exactly the reason why now ICAT has mandated the member states to forbid any landing of hammerhead species on the long line fleets. There is an era of research on marine ecology and behavior before the advent of electronic tagging and another one after the advent of electronic tagging. The capacity of these devices to open windows into the life of these animals and into the significance of particular habitats is just too precious for us to leave it behind. That's a female. That's a female. I hold for years, maybe. 
We think this site is a nursery, so we're going to attach an acoustic transmitter to this female so that we can find out whether she comes back next year. So these guys, they heal really fast, these kind of wounds. Yeah. We've attached the acoustic transmitter. We're going to move forward to oxygenate the shark, and then we'll attach the satellite transmitter. This satellite tag, called a pop-up, is quite distinctive. After 300 days, the tag will be released and rise to the surface, where it will send all its data to the satellite. This will provide detailed and accurate information about the shark's dives and how deep it went. And if it traveled any long distances during these 300 days, we'll learn that too. Okay, whenever you want. One, two, head first, three. three. Woohoo! Without knowing it, this female will be providing scientists with vital data. They'll use it to learn more about her movements and eventually to help put protective measures in place for this extremely threatened species. To study the ocean's great migrators, we must travel great distances. With the same team of biologists, we're headed for Coco Island off the Pacific coast of Costa Rica. Coco Island is a paradise for both biologists and divers who come here from around the world. The marine biodiversity here is exceptional, and it's known for its abundant shark population. The sharks of Cocos Island migrate between Cocos, Galapagos, and Malpelo, Colombia. So it's really a shared population. This is very important because, of course, we can protect the sharks in Cocos Island as much as we want, but then they're going to go to other islands and they must be protected there as well. And also, let's say all three countries get together and say, okay, we have to protect them more when they're on these three islands, but what about when they're migrating in between? So we need the information now on when are the times where the sharks are migrating so that we can design, of course, the, the corridors. Our goal is to install a satellite transmitter onto a hammerhead shark. If we're successful, we'll gain a much better understanding of where these sharks go, and we'll be able to suggest protection measures. It's very urgent that we gather accurate data on the sharks' migration routes so that we can adopt effective conservation measures. Catching a hammerhead shark will not be easy. They are very cunning animals, and there are fewer and fewer around Coco Island. And because there are many different kinds of sharks, our bait may attract other species. But it's very important that we get a satellite transmitter onto a shark to better understand how they move around in this area of the Pacific. There are many illegal fishermen around here, and we must put conservation measures into place quickly. Fortunately, you know, the government of Costa Rica recently increased the protection around Cocos. They're taking stronger actions against the illegal fishermen. I really hope we can curtail all these illegal fisheries and that we can somehow control you know, the uncontrolled fisheries that are happening now in the eastern tropical Pacific because hammerheads definitely have dropped during this last year. The decline of shark species is caused by overfishing, 
prompted largely by the demand for shark fins, which can fetch up to several hundred dollars per kilo. There is a 12-mile protected zone around Coco Island in which no fishing is allowed. Obviously, the extraordinary biodiversity here attracts many poachers. We see them sitting just outside the 12-mile limit on our radar. The island has a monitoring system, wardens and boats, but they can't do anything when the poachers are outside the park. Yet we know very well that these poachers frequently enter the park because they have no notion of conservation. All they want to do is catch fish and sell it. When they come into the park, they often play a game of hide-and-seek with the park wardens. At night, it's the law of the jungle, and the poachers are much better at the game than the wardens. So at night, out at sea, there's a war going on. On the island, the evidence of poaching is striking. You see it everywhere. For example, this bridge across a small river was made from fishing boys seized by park wardens. The director of Cocos Island National Park agreed to talk to us about this serious situation. This is where we store all the fishing gear. We can see here a number of different kinds of buoys. Do you see how many of them are painted? They do this to make them almost invisible and difficult for us to spot. We keep all the confiscated equipment here. As you can see, there is a lot. It's a big problem because it's all equipment that was set up in protected areas. We manage all of this as garbage. This here is the gear typically used by longliners. These are the lines and hooks used to catch shark. You know that the Cocos Island is also known as Shark's Island. Even our emblem is a hammerhead shark, and they are now an endangered species. There are pressure zones that are between 8 and 10 miles from the coast. The fishermen know when we're coming and sail off. So by the time we reach the point where we first spotted them on radar, they're gone. And that's where we find all this fishing gear. Sometimes they've even had enough time to cut or retrieve their lines by then. We say that fishermen are like sly hunters, an exotic species introduced into an environment into which they don't belong. And even though it's a big ocean, the ecosystem around the island is especially rich. We can't keep the fish in cages to protect them. This is where we keep the boys we retrieve. Most of them come from Taiwan, and they paint them so they can sneak past the patrols. Look at the difference. This is one that hasn't been painted, and this is one that has. With the painted ones especially, we can clearly see the intention behind them to harm the protected area by fishing shark and tuna. We need to reevaluate our strategies to counteract this problem. We're not here just to patrol and protect. We need to take it further and work on reforming our fisheries and navigation laws. This is a magnificent place with a wealth of marine life worth protecting. 
That is the least we can do with what we have. We must quickly develop new protection measures here in the island and at a national level to protect the resources. The team of scientists continues its efforts, but the days go by and the large numbers of hammerhead sharks that Cocos Islands is famous for are still missing. The team decides to change the protocol. At this point, any species will do. The scientists must absolutely catch a shark for their research. Unfortunately, I'm not seeing the same number of hammerhead sharks. I used to see hundreds at the different stations in Manuelita, at Dirty Rock, in Alcyon. And about three trips ago, last year in September, we came, and there were hardly any sharks, but the water was very warm. And everybody said, well, it's El Nino, the water's warm. The sharks will come back as soon as it gets cold. And OK, um, but yeah, the water's a lot colder now, and they're not coming back. There was a place like this in Mexico, the Gulf of Cortez. And they had hammerheads just like here. And they wiped them out in the 90s. You know, they can be wiped out. The scientists have tried everything. They spread blood in the water to attract sharks, use baited buoys, anything to catch a shark. One particular night was extremely frustrating. We were trying to catch a shark for science, and yet on our radar we saw poachers coming into the park and setting their lines. And they probably had a better chance of catching a shark than we did. There was nothing we could do except alert the wardens. They said they would try to stop them, but we knew very well that their chances of catching the poachers were slim. So we have a boat. Do you see the boat there? At what distance? It's about 12 miles away. It's about 12 miles away. It's leaving the Cocoa Island National Park limits. Are you heading right out to look for them? Yes, we're going straight there. Earlier, this boat came within three miles of ours. Clearly, it was completely inside the park boundary, so the fishing equipment could be just about anywhere. What they do is cast their lines, then leave the park limits. What they do is cast their lines, and then leave the park limits. They'll remain outside at the 12-mile limit, where they cannot be caught. An important point to explain in all of this is that if we reach them, we will most likely find fishing here. But unless it's connected to the boat, we cannot prove that it belongs to them. The fishermen see us patrolling because they have radars like ours. And as soon as we start off towards them, they move further away. And so we can retrieve and confiscate the equipment. But unless the boat is right there, there is no way to prove anything. So, unless the lines are actually connected to the boat, you, you can do nothing. Even if the lines are only a meter away and full of fish. Exactly. For example, we can accuse them of illegal fishing, and two or three years later the case will end up in court. But when the judge asked the park ranger if he saw that the lines were connected to the boat, if the answer is no, and the captain denies that the lines were his, then the case is dropped. This is one of the biggest problems we face here in the Cocoa Island National Park. We know what the problem is. We just need to change the law so that every fishing buoy is identified with a boat number. That would solve the problem. If a fishing buoy is found inside the park with your boat number on it, you're guilty, period. 
Along the coast, measures to protect birthing areas are not much better. The team joins another group of scientists in Golfito Bay in Costa Rica. The Tiburon mission team is studying the life cycle of young hammerhead sharks that gather in this bay. The biologists are working directly with some local fishermen to try and provide protection for female hammerhead sharks who give birth in the area. During the months of July and August, is when there is a jump in the number of, specifically, young hammerhead sharks being captured. This just confirms that it's the season in which female hammerheads migrate to the coast. They probably come in May or June and leave their pups to grow in this protected area because it is a safe nursery, rich in nutrients. Here they can live for their first two to four years until they're adults, until they can make the great migrations to other islands, such as the Malpelo and Galapagos, where adult hammerheads are often seen. This is our reality here in Gulf of Dulce and other areas along the coast of Costa Rica, where the hammerhead shark is often unintentionally caught by fishermen as bycatch. One of these fishermen has agreed to talk on camera. On average, how many hammerhead sharks do you catch every day? Depending on the area, in one day we can catch up to 100 sometimes more, in other areas, none. But whenever they're caught like this, most of them are already dead, up to 70 percent are already dead. These aren't illegal fishermen. They're simple family fishermen trying to make a living. But for two months, they fish right in the shark nurseries. The problem with this species is that it spends most of its time swimming to oxygenate itself. When these sharks get caught in the fishing lines, their movement is limited so they can't breathe and they quickly die. That's why during those months fishing in this area must be prohibited. Sixty-three, forty-eight, macho, male. It's a It's a newborn. It still has the opening from the umbilical cord. It's sixty-three centimeters in length. Hammerheads are born between fifty and sixty centimeters. That male is two weeks to a month old, no more than two months. He's ready for relax. An interesting fact is that in the Gulf of Dulce, there are more male than female hammerheads. It may be a strategy to ensure genetic diversity within the species. Come on, come on, go! He's stunned, but he'll recover. The capture of this young tiger shark is not good news. Other endangered species also appear to use the Golfito area to give birth among the mangroves along the coast. We're trying to protect the adults in their migrations, but we're leaving behind the young in the coastal waters. It's sad because we work hard to try and protect the hammerhead. And when we see these things, we become discouraged. It kills the flame. But at the same time, it's the reason we keep working. We need to know more about them to protect them. We need to work closer with the fishing communities to make their protection a reality. In Puerto Jimenez, there aren't many traditional fishermen, only around 20 to 30 families whose livelihood depend directly on traditional fishing. There are a lot of options in the area, there's a lot of tourism. There are even many other marine species during these months, like whales and dolphins. And these can provide some alternatives, like tourism. We have to work with the fishermen so they understand that the hammerhead is endangered and that these sharks are worth more alive than dead. You're free! 
Boy, see, stay you. The biologists of Mission Tiburon are doing fantastic work. They raise awareness with young people and fishermen, but it will take more than that. We need laws to protect the shark's birthing sites and nurseries for these two critical months of the year. And we need to find a way to financially compensate the 20 or so fishing families during this period. It shouldn't be that hard. It probably costs more to send scientists somewhere in the world to meet two or three times to try and understand the problem than it does to implement real measures to compensate these fishermen. But we must absolutely find a way to protect the zones during these two critical months. The conservation problems in our oceans are caused mainly by overfishing. Governments know it, and scientists have been saying it for years. Even worse, scientists are saying that we have maybe 40 or 50 years to change our ways, or fish stocks will collapse. So if the overfishing problem isn't solved early in this century, there will be no more fishing at all by the end of the century. Longline fishing is non-selective and every year its bycatch kills a huge number of non-commercial fish, turtles, birds, and other species. One longliner can deploy up to 100 kilometers of line equipped with thousands of baited hooks. This type of fishing primarily targets large fish, such as swordfish, which are a good source of income for fishermen. But overfishing has reduced stocks to the point where revenues are not sufficient to cover the cost of the industry. The significant decline in swordfish populations has forced the industry to develop new markets. Long considered bycatch, sharks were once thrown back due to their low value. But the growth of the lucrative shark fin market has changed the strategy of the industry. There's very little known about sharks and shark science only started until the 90s. And I think all shark scientists now share the concern that we're running out of sharks and we really need to work together to generate the information we need and to get the political change we need. And One day, Randall managed to get a friend hired on as a cook on a fishing boat. The images he took documented for the first time what happens at sea, far from prying eyes. The footage shows turtles and all sorts of bycatch, but the most disturbing images are of what happens to the sharks. These were the first images of what's called shark finning. In its most barbaric form, the shark is brought on board, its fins and tail cut off, and then it's thrown back to the sea, often still alive. Obviously, without its fins and tail, the animal can no longer swim and circulate water through its gills, so it dies an agonizing death by suffocation. It's a cruel practice, and these images galvanized public opinion. First of all, it's a cruel, painful death for these magnificent animals. Uh, from a more technical point of view, it's unsustainable. They're wiping out marine biodiversity so that a culture on the other side of the world can have their shark fin soup. These images of shark finning helped raise public awareness, and some countries now ban the practice. But this has not stopped shark fishing altogether. What happened is that a new market has been created. Many countries now require fishermen to keep the shark carcasses. In a way, by creating a market for shark meat, we have legalized a once condemned practice. But nothing has really changed. We're putting even more pressure on shark populations. The way fisheries are controlled out here in the open sea, it's no man's land. It's everyone take all. Everything is for free. And that isn't changing yet. And I think that is something that many countries have to work on. The United States, the Economic Union, Australia, which is a big fishing nation. And, you know, we need to get together and change the way fishery policy is established. We have a very interesting relationship with the government of Costa Rica. However, we have a very bad relationship with the Costa Rican Fisheries Institute.
The Fishery Institute is an autonomous institute, which means it's not part of the central government. And since it's autonomous, they are not ruled by the president. They are ruled by a board of directors. And guess who's on the board of directors? Shark finners, shrimp trawlers, tuna purseiners. So they're all there not to establish public policy. They're there to protect their own private interests. What we need is fisheries directed with science in mind. How many boats can fish this resource? When should we stop fishing? Where should we not fish? Then even if it hurts somebody's pocket, we must stop fishing. The fishing fleets have grown in the past decades dependent on subsidies from governments. That is, the real cost involved in sending a fishing vessel out there with all the costs in fuel, in gear, in paying the crewmen, etc., is just not uh, overturned by the real profit that the catch is going to make in the market. And the only reason why that fleet or that particular vessel is doing its everyday fishing is because it gets subsidies from all of us taxpayers to lower the cost of those, uh, uh, of those items. If we would be to take all the subsidies to the fishing fleets all over the world, and in particular in developed countries, most of those fleets would stop the day after. By creating a new market for shark bait, the fishing industry is committed to using much of the resource. But at 63 euro cents per kilo, less than a dollar, some wonder whether this new market for shark bait is not simply a cover for continuing the lucrative trade in shark fins. to catch a shark off Cocos Islands continues. Time is passing and the scientists are redoubling their efforts. Pedro and George have been working day and night. There's no question of giving up. They can't leave empty-handed. The stakes are too high. If we want to effectively protect and conserve these highly migratory species, we need to figure out where the critical habitats are located, whether they are for mating purposes, for spawning purposes, or for juvenile growth purposes. This is the main issue. Yeah, that's okay, that's okay, that's okay. Finally, after many attempts, they catch one. It's not a hammerhead, but the team can still track its movements and learn the migration routes of this Galapagos shark. Vertebrates in general have this thing called the tonic immobility reflex, which basically is when you're turned upside down, you become numb. And they get really, really, really uh, amenable to work with. Um, and we think that they also get a decreased uh, pain function. We do that to promote natural anesthesia. Okay. Yeah, more ever. That's the tag. This is a female Galapagos shark. Uh, they just installed an acoustic tag inside it. This issues a sound that can be heard 500 meters around. And this tag will work for at least five years. So we expect to get some really good data because the tag is implanted inside the animal, so we're sure it's not going to be lost. Yeah, go for it. Quick action is needed. The scientists install the satellite tag. Okay, bottom one. Keep going for a while. Yeah. Well, the shark looks a little tired, and it's you know it's already been hooked for a few minutes, and I'm just a little concerned that you know the time it'll take to deploy the satellite transmitter on it might be a little too long. It is very invasive, but then at the same time, the the information you get out of a single animal is so valuable compared to using other type of tags. But on the other hand. Very invasive, and yeah, you have to act fast. Usually, after the first stage of the operation, 
we turn the shark over and move the boat to oxygenate the animal. This revives it from its comatose state. But this shark wasn't reacting. We began to get anxious. Okay, so see the okay, yeah. so That's direction is good. holding now. In the end, it was just a scare. The female Galapagos shark regained her senses and swam off with the transmitter. So she will provide a lot of essential data for scientists. In the days that follow, divers managed to install acoustic transmitters on other shark species, including one of the few hammerhead sharks spotted around Cocos Island. This glimpse into the world of sharks and fishing really makes you think. Scientists have identified most of the problems, and solutions do exist. But if we want to save these threatened species, what's missing is a willingness to implement those solutions. This will probably mean making sacrifices and changing our consumption habits so we can change the model and build a different relationship with the oceans. If we want to preserve what remains of our oceans, we'll have to pay the price for our past abuses. I think there is no miracle solution to the biggest problem of all, which is how are we going to give uh, food to everybody while wild fish are just going low and low in numbers? Um, there is two main uh, hopes in our capacity to solve that. One is aquaculture, but we also know that aquaculture has a lot of environmental and even social problems associated with it, and we need to solve those. And the other is obviously a more sustainable management of global fishing uh, in the world. And that might take the exploitation of lower trophic chain resources, which can still give good protein to people and release a little bit our pressure on the top levels. So balanced harvesting is becoming a major hope in the fisheries science arena. We talk about sharks are going extinct, how important they are for the ecosystem. You know, and we go to meetings and we go to conventions and we design strategies and then we have meetings to see what went wrong with the strategy and then another meeting to, to push the strategy again and this time it is gonna work, you know. So all this talk and talk and talk, but no action. Apparently we don't have time. Scientists are saying we have another 40 or 50 years before it's all depleted. In our lifetime, we may see this big dramatic change and let's hope we can stop it. We need everybody's help. There are serious conservation challenges, but I'm optimistic. When humanity mobilizes, we can accomplish great things. We mustn't forget that everything on Earth is interconnected. We depend on other species for our own survival. If we can change the way we coexist with other species, I'm convinced we can get there. We can do it, I'm sure.
I have always been fascinated by the ocean. Throughout this expedition, our divers have shared the sea with extraordinary but often little-known fish, corals, plants and animals. But for me, the most mythical and deeply touching inhabitants of the deep are whales. The team has headed to the Silver Bank, off the coast of the Dominican Republic, in the Caribbean Sea. Every year in winter, humpback whales return to this protected shoal to breed and give birth. It's a magnificent place where one can slip into the whale's environment and share their world. There are few places on the planet like this where we can draw back the curtain on their lives. By spending time with these whales, we can better understand them and ultimately better protect them. There are few places where humans can share the underwater world of the last giants on Earth. But access to the Silver Bank Sanctuary is strictly controlled. Only three boats have permits to observe humpback whales during the breeding and calving season. The crew has left the Sedna Four to join the Sun Dancer, a ship that has plied these waters for many years. It takes about 12 hours to reach the sanctuary. For this expedition, two leading experts on whales have joined mission leader Jean Lemire. Richard Sears, who travels the world to study whales, and Sal Sergio, who began his career as a biologist on Silver Bank. After nearly 30 years, Sal and Richard are back on Silver Bank with the same passion and desire to study whales. The idea of coming here back then was to gather all the scientists from the Northeast who were working on humpback whales, from the St. Lawrence to Newfoundland and Labrador to New England, together on Silver Bank. When I found out about it, I was naturally thrilled to take part and come observe where these whales go in the winter. It was the first time that we really focused on photo identification of humpback flukes to find out where all the whales on Silver Bank were coming from. I was here 28 years ago, and when the opportunity to come back to Silver Bank arose, there was no way I could resist. On that trip, it just so happened that there were several major scientists that were currently doing work with humpback whales. So I got quite lucky to be involved in a project of that level. And you know, I was you know, on the breeding grounds of humpback whales in the North Atlantic, one of the most densest aggregations on the planet. Scientists like to go where the whales are abundant. Doing research far at sea is extremely difficult, so where there are a lot of whales, you'll often find an abundance of scientists too. Jean and Richard are old research colleagues. From the Sea of Cortez to Iceland to the Gulf of St. Lawrence in Canada, they have worked together to photograph different species of whales around the world. Photography is the basis of whale research. Patterns of skin pigmentation are unique to each animal, which allows them to be recognized and told apart. This is essential for studying their behavior. This is an example of a humpback photo ID. It's like a fingerprint. They are kind enough to lift their fluke when they dive, and the pattern on the underside of the tail is unique for each animal. It can vary from completely black to completely white. Totalement noir, totalement blanc. 
We learn about the species by studying individuals, and there are now huge photo ID catalogs of humpback populations around the world. Now that the catalogs have been digitized, when we get to a place where someone has taken pictures of humpbacks, we can attempt to find a match and identify the individual using a simple computer or even an iPad. Photo identification has helped pinpoint the main gathering sites of humpbacks around the world. The discovery of Silver Bank, the humpback's main breeding site in the Atlantic, is a result of this collaboration between different research teams. In the Pacific, humpbacks gather around the Hawaiian Islands in winter to breed and give birth. When I was much younger, I had the privilege of working in Hawaii for several winters. I had a scientific permit to swim with the whales and study their behavior during the breeding season. It was fascinating work. This underwater world is so foreign to us. We know so little about it, but we think that the whale's reproductive strategy revolves around the females. Males are often aggressive toward each other, and we sometimes witness intense combats to win the favors of a female. The male closest to the female is called the escort. He is constantly confronted by other males called challengers. They want to get close to the female to mate with her. This can lead to violent combats. But this is all hypothesis. No one has ever witnessed humpback whales mating. The same goes for calving. We do not yet have convincing visual proof. I remember one day, I filmed the erect penis of a male approaching a female. The footage has become popular because it's not something you see every day. But spectacular as it was, it didn't prove a thing. It's all hypothesis. There are clues, but in science, you need irrefutable proof. There were situations where we were surrounded by 10 or 15 males fighting amongst each other, and it was tense at times. But they are among the most memorable moments of my career. In recent decades, scientists have made their most important scientific discoveries about whales at winter gathering areas like the Dominican Republic. The seasonal gatherings of humpbacks on breeding grounds give scientists a chance to accumulate a large amount of data on the various subpopulations. It's marvelous to monitor a group over a long distance on Silver Bank. I couldn't have imagined it any better when Jean spoke to me about returning here. It's amazing to watch this group of active males on the surface. That's a baby breach. The clear water at Silver Bank lets scientists share the whale's underwater world. This protected shoal is shallow, making it easier to observe and study whale behavior throughout the water column. Mothers and calves are much calmer than males, who often engage in combat. They don't move around much, allowing biologists to observe the interactions between mother and calf. Wow. 
Wow. Yeah, did you see the way the calf was let go by the mother? Yeah. Just came right up to the surface. She stayed down there and then she okay. came up to those ducks. Amazing. Calves are often reckless. In a spirit of mutual curiosity, the mother allows the scientists and her offspring to interact. You're not scared. These are what I call little moments of eternity. They get etched into your memory forever. It was fantastic. I've never had an experience like that before. Oh. Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> And she just came up and breezed through there without touching any of us. I would have touched her pectoral fin. I would have yeah. had it. Yeah. Okay. Would have touched what? La mère laisse venir. The mother allowed her curious calf to approach us. It was no more than three months old. Donc il est curieux, donc il nage vers nous. The mother was calm and watchful. If the calf came too close, she would just come over and turn. And we were sort of trapped between the calf and the mother. Daniela wound up right over the mother's back, but she didn't move. And it was the mother who moved off. Not far, maybe a hundred feet, and then return to the bottom. The calf moved under the mother. Really, it was the perfect situation. In our experience working in Mexico, the whales aren't as curious and they're not as tolerant. So we can approach them in the boat, but they don't come over and, and check us out and go under the boat and look at us and approach us more in the water. That was completely new. Yeah. No, it was fantastic. I mean, it, and also it was so long. I mean, sometimes you get in with whales and it, you get a nice gift for five minutes, ten minutes, but this went on for hours and we'd get out and this time we were able to stay in a good long amount of time. It's been really, been a really nice moments. Incredible. With encounters like that, you, you can die happy tomorrow. Incredible. It's the very end of the season, so there are a lot of very active males in large groups. We want to study the relationship between the escort 
and the challengers. The escort is the male closest to the female, and all the other males fight to get as close to the female as possible. Amidst all this action are a few isolated males who decide to sing. We'll put the hydrophone in the water and hear many singers, because the songs carry well in the water. But the hard part is isolating one. It's challenging, but we probably have the best people on board for it, so with a bit of luck, we'll be successful. Right now we're searching for a singer. It's kind of like looking for a needle in a haystack. And what we want to do is keep moving, listening each time we move, to look for um, a single individual singer to get louder and louder. And once it gets louder from one stop to another, we know we're moving in the right direction and then we can start to look for him on the surface. Finding a lone male singer among groups of humpback whales is a real challenge. Scientists must identify certain parts of the song, long prolonged growls, that mean the male is about to surface. They then scan the horizon for the whale's spout on the surface and try to approach the male slowly to avoid any kind of disturbance. When you find your singer, you're ecstatic. When you slip into the water with him, the song is so powerful that your internal organs vibrate. It's hard to describe. It's simply extraordinary. Just like human songs, humpback whale songs are organized into verses and refrains. The song changes over the course of a year, but the amazing thing is that at some point, all the males end up singing the same song. We don't understand exactly how this happens, but it's extraordinary. And what's even more incredible, listen to what happens if we speed up the song. Here, we've sped it up 14 times. Listen. It's very much like the structure of bird song in its complexity. It's just that humpback whales sing very, very slowly. It's fascinating. Song in the humpback whale is a major part of a breeding system and the role it plays in the breeding system. So it attracts a lot of attention because of the emotional attachment that people have with song. And that's both on the level of what we as humans come to uh, what song is all about. Song is an incredible uh, aspect of every single culture. It's a very important aspect of every single culture on the planet. This song changes throughout the breeding season. In spring, when the whales begin their long migration north, the males stop singing. The singing of males is often associated with courtship, a sort of seductive serenade to attract females. But this is just a theory. Despite significant advances in the understanding of whale behavior, the exact function of the humpback song remains a mystery. At any given time, all males in a group sing essentially the same or very similar songs. They 
change the song over time. Um, it's a gradual and progressive change. And all whales within a group change their song in the same ways. So they're learning from each other. Um, and the, the last remarkable aspect of it is that within an ocean basin, animals that have contact at some point in time are sharing those songs and sharing those changes and changing in the same way. Scientists still do not understand how males share the same song. They also wonder how the song is transmitted over long distances, well beyond the hearing range of a single group gathered in the same area. But beyond science, the incredible emotion produced when you experience this unique phenomenon is perhaps its greatest mystery. With the arrival of spring begins the long migration north. After fasting during the breeding season, it is time for the whales to head to the rich waters of the northern latitudes. Photo identification and satellite tags have identified different feeding sites in the Atlantic, ranging from the coast of New England up to Iceland and even Norway. In the Pacific, humpback whales migrate too. They leave the breeding area of Hawaii and head to Alaska to feed. Some whales in this area of the Pacific have developed a truly special feeding technique. Rather than feed alone, some humpbacks form groups to capture their prey. The herring that school in the rich waters of Alaska in summer. These whales have developed a shrill feeding call, which they use to synchronize their assault on schools of fish. They also use bubbles expelled from their blowholes to create a sort of net. The feeding call frightens the herring, while the bubble net herds them together. The work of biologist Fred Sharp has helped to understand this truly unique fishing technique, one used only by a small number of humpback whales. I worked with Fred Sharp here in Alaska a long time ago. I think it was 1996. We were trying to film everything on the surface to understand what was going on. At the same time, we had hydrophones in the water to try to understand who was doing what in the groups. Later, this work formed the basis for many well-known studies. I arrived in Alaska in 1987, and I came up as a naturalist and uh, saw my first bubble net and never looked back. I guess the most important thing I've learned about these humpback whales is that they're all incredible individuals. Each one seems to have its own story. It's a story that may last up to a century. They have their own ways of feeding. They have their own friends, their own places, their own places they call home. And that's been the most wonderful part is just learning the tremendous lives of these whales. The humpback whale in Southeast Alaska is truly one of our most abundant and amazing backyard predators. Almost all of them are from Polynesia, uh, the Hawaiian Islands and they come up here in May and they'll spend six to eight months feeding on herring and krill. And then around Christmas time, they head back to the islands of Hawaii and complete their amazing life cycle. Right there, oh, right yeah. there. Hold this position. Captain, should we move a little bit to have the photo ID of this one? That's just phenomenal. He's gonna die. There he goes. Great. Hello. The idea is to be as perpendicular to the fluke as possible. Each fluke has a distinctive pigmentation pattern that allows us to photo ID the animals. It is important to be able to identify individual whales because if we want to study their behavior, we have to be able to tell the individuals apart. 
All body marks are important, so we try to take a lateral photograph of the dorsal fin and then one of the fluke. That way, we can be sure that we get the ID right. And if we're ever in shallow water and the whales don't show their tails, we also have the dorsal fin as a reference. How many animals do you have in your catalog? About 1,000. 1,000? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, pretty big. Uh, Jan's got about 2,000 in the park. There's probably about 3,000, 3,500 animals for the northern southeast Alaska. A few Guadalajarans come up, a few Mexicans. A um, few Asiatics show up once in a while, but... Mainly Hawaiian. Hawaiian. Yeah, almost all Hawaiian. Bubbles. Bubble. Right, right here. here. See that nice softball side? Yeah. <laughs> and the classic. Now those are the ones that really scare the fish the most. Bigger, faster, they reflect more light. Um, they make a lot more noise. Those are the real workhorse of the bubble net. But, um, and it looks like, looks like this one, and it looks like it might be going in a counterclockwise circle. That's kind of interesting. About 90% of the animals blow in a clockwise circle. Oh, yeah. And it's remarkable in that it's the same level of handedness or laterality that humans have. So it's another striking similarity between humpback whales and humans. Hmm. Here we are, bare enough, warm spring, so um, what's the plan, Fred? Well, I figure um, we're going to have a lot of fog this morning, so what do you think, Cap? You feel comfortable navigating in these fogs? Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is not a problem. It's supposed to burn off by midday, uh, and it's actually, I think it, I think it already is starting to burn off a little bit. So I figure um, good time for running north, and uh, hopefully things will burn off by the time we get up to the confluence of Peril Strait and Chatham, and that's uh, so why we probably got three, four hours. To get up there. When we uh, arrived by plane, <coughs> we saw you know good group of whales around Parker Point. Right. So you know it's close to an so. Yeah. Typically, there's a lot of herring schools still in this area at this time of the year, and it's been kind of an unusual year. It seems like the herring has sort of picked up and moved out of Dodge, and so in some ways we're looking for the prey as much as we are the whales. We have the weather on our side, so let's yeah, move. we do. <laughs> feed in a remarkable variety of ways. And the krill, these small shrimp-like crustaceans, they're quite easy for the whales to catch, and so most of the time when they're feeding on the krill, they can do it alone. Typically they hunt the krill by just swimming up to a school and opening their mouth and engulfing them. They'll laterally lunge, they'll roll to the surface, they will um, lunge up through them, um, but they will use a whole variety of techniques. Amazing. But there's whales everywhere, everywhere. <laughs> hey, he's he. Yeah, yeah, wow. yeah. That was great. Amazing. So that's your friend. 
beautiful animal. And, you know, it's funny that he is so friendly. Did you see on his tail he had where he had ropes? Or he'd been in nets before. Yeah. yeah. He has been insulted by humanity, but yet he comes over to be to be curious and interactive. It's amazing. It's almost like forgiveness. Yeah. It's wow. On such a beautiful evening too. Yeah. Perfect. There's his footprint. Yeah. What do you suppose? He just curious? He just Just curious. Just yeah. wanted to know who we are and what's up yeah. and we are with a very curious whale, one that keeps passing right under our boat. And what's amazing is that it comes very close and then turns slightly to look at us. It's done this three or four times. And see, again, instead of chasing the whale, yeah, yeah, exactly. you just wait yeah. and you're attacked. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Couldn't have said it better, my son. Couldn't have said it better. <laughs> going hey. under, going under. Hello, hello. Thanks for coming back. It's gonna be near you, Captain. Thanks for the fluke ID. Yeah. Nice. Amazing. 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 Yeah, coming, coming right here, right here. He's rolling over. Rolling, rolling. Wow. Yeah. They know exactly what they're doing. They swim around the boat and turn to look at us. This one rolled right on its side to really get a good look at us. It's hard to know why they do it, but one thing is sure. It's very much a conscious act. You know, I've just been so incredibly curious about them for, you know, a quarter of a century, and it's nice to finally think they want to know a little bit about us. It's really touching, and it's really, um, it's kind of a gift. Yeah. And they, they share so many similarities with humans. Their brain is, is gigantic, and it's laced with spindle neurons, and in humans, those are associated with language acquisition, social intelligence, and compassion. And we see a lot of compassionate acts with humpback whales, the way they'll protect their young if there's predators around, and they'll come to each other's aid, and um, just general interspecies interest that's a sense of higher, higher cognitive function. Yeah. The weather has taken a turn for the worse, so it will be harder to work now. Today we hope that the whales we saw yesterday, individually using bubbles to feed down deep, will come together at the surface so we can observe them using this technique as a group when the attacks are synchronized with song. It's truly spectacular. Calling the Washington State Ferry Fairweather. This is the Wayfinder, do you copy 1-6? This is the State Ferry Fairweather, WDB 5604, back to the call. Okay, Fairweather. We kindly wanted to inquire about any number of cetaceans, particularly humpback whales, that you might have seen in your journey through Peril Strait, over. At 11.03, we saw a bubble net feeding just inside uh, between Pavarotny and Light 22. And at 14.30, we spotted a couple of whales, but there wasn't a lot of bird activity, and we didn't see any bubble feeding on our way, you know, this direction. Well, thank you so much, and kindly, if you, in your further journeys, come across any more significant numbers of bubble net feeding humpback whales, we'd really appreciate uh, to hear from you. Roger. The people of Alaska know whales and their behavior. This is an asset for Fred Sharp who must travel great distances to find the whales that use this particular feeding technique. 
the observations received from the ferry now guide the boat to a small, isolated inlet. These whales are hungry, and they're looking for food. They're cruising the strip. They're looking to mix it up. They um, need about half a ton of food a day, and humpbacks have this large trick-or-treat bag made out of spandex on their tummy, and they feed by engulfing big, big chunks out of the ecosystem every time they feed. It's almost uh, night. They normally, you know, slow down at yeah, this time yeah. of the day, right? Well, this is very typical. About this time of the evening, the whales, um, the rate with which they're feeding slows down. They seem to lose the beat on the herring. The fish are more scattered out, and they move out to mid-channel where they can get their sea room and have uh, plenty of space, their ocean moorage, yeah. and they go to sleep. And they get a good night's sleep, so they're ready to get at it in the morning. <laughs> Before night sets in, Fred and Jean have photo ID'd a small group of feeding whales. This is standard procedure, almost a reflex for researchers who use cameras as a primary research tool. But that night, an examination of the photographs reveals something unexpected. A wonderful surprise that also demonstrates the effectiveness of photo identification. An old friend has reappeared. Uh, I think that might be Trumpeter. Yeah, we found him. <laughs> that, and great news, tr if it's Trumpeter, I mean, yeah. we know that's a good leader. Yeah. Very good leader. Trumpeter and Jan are big old friends. Yes. They go way back. Yeah, oh, yeah. Remember back in 1996? Yeah. Here's our friend Trumpeter. Yeah. And you can compare it to what we obtained on this voyage. And oh, yeah. what do you think? Yeah, that's a match. Look, that little thing here, same pigmentation pattern. Nice serrated trailing edge. And here's why we call him Trumpeter. The most amazing sounds. Makes the most brilliant low. It starts out with this nice low, um, steady, and then he just goes off the scale. It's like you're saying, Miles Davis. <laughs> In the morning, Trumpeter, the humpback whale first identified in 1996, was waiting for them. Nice. Trumpeter again. Yep, you were right. That's him, right? Yeah, that's amazing. God, it's like... In 96, Trumpeter was leading a big group and he was really, you know, yep. active and he was the one who was uh, start, starting the feeding call, yep. doing the bubbles and everything, yep. and always going very high compared yep. to yeah. the other, yeah. right in the middle. You know, he, he disappeared from the database for like seven years and we thought he'd gone to the great bubble net in the sky, and, but he's back and leading team bubble net. That should be plenty deep. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, nice and loud. The feeding calls that the humpbacks produce appear to be unique here in Southeast Alaska. Um, everywhere you go, it seems like they have their special nuances, but here in Alaska, we're richly rewarded by these loud, beautiful feeding calls, larger groups with more stable, enduring friendships. Oh, nice feeding call. 
clear, pure. I mean, it, it hurts my ears. I sit in the lab and listen to this hour after hour, and it's like, after a while, it's like, this is crazy. Do they start the feeding called first and the bubble after, or? Seems to be a lot of variation there. Yeah, a lot of individual style, but uh, typically we'll uh, hear the bubbles and the feeding call start about the same time. Oh, now you can hear the bubbles coming up. You hear that? Deploying the bubble net, percolating it out of the, out of the blowhole as far as we know. These Alaskan whales have developed a unique feeding technique in which whales cooperate to capture prey. After more than 15 years, scientists have concluded that Trumpeter is still a leader among the whales, often sounding the charge and commanding the troops. Those sounds that you're hearing, those are the whales diving below the herring schools and producing these incredibly loud, annoying sounds. It's almost like turning a fire alarm on a building and all you want to do is run for the exits. Well, that's what the whales are doing. And one whale going in usually a clockwise fashion and the bubbles rise up and effervesce and create this amazing corral. It's almost like a, it's almost like a rocket tube that the whales then come shooting up and engulf the prey at the surface. The increase of humpback whales, both here in the Pacific and throughout the world, is one of the best conservation success stories. And it's, it's remarkable to see how humans can, you know, exhibit concern for the environment and then show some conservation wisdom. And we're richly rewarded to see the humpbacks returning to all these waters. I don't think we'll ever start hunting the humpback whales in a large manner again. I think they're just too beloved and too many people care about them. And I think there's many other concerns, um, climate change, ocean acidification, pollution, acoustic sounds bothering them. Um, there's many, many concerns, but I don't think the harpoon is one of them. The complexity of whale song is an exquisite example of how nature and evolution have shaped living things to exist in balance with their environment. It took millions of years to create this balance, so more than ever, it's vital that we do everything we can to protect the living heritage of our planet, so that whale song can go on delighting our children and our children's children. <laughs>